I did not even have enough paper for my notes. <laughs> I know you I saw button, us. If I can, if I can button up one last story for you guys and just show you this, you can use it for the recording, or you don't have to. And I'll, and I'll just do it this way. So you remember when I was talking earlier about the fact that we were enslaved on a plantation in Jones County, North Carolina? Uh, what you're looking at right now is four generations later, my daughter, who graduated high school, was accepted to 24 universities. UCs, CSUs, publics, privates, all over the place, all over the country. And she took that and she graduated Spelman College, the number one historically black college in the country for African-American women. She took that degree and she was able to graduate in three years. And now she's in her doctorate program at the University of California, Riverside. And so I always tell these stories so that people can understand that Yes, you may have started somewhere and had a tough story, but also understand that you stand on the shoulders of greatness. And with that story and with those shoulders that you can make change, not only for yourself, but for the community and for future generations. Wow. Thank you. That's so good. I work in the teacher education program. Um, at UC Riverside and that's where I teach. And so I hope I come across her face one day. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, she's, she's on the campus right now. She, she's, uh, she just finished her master's degree and she now, let's see, she's, in her, she's, she's finishing all her coursework for the uh -huh. doctorate and she just started teaching last year. So this is her first year of teaching. She's 23 years old. Wow. Jeez Louise. Oh. Yeah. So where is she teaching? Uh, she's teaching in the anthropology department. Okay. Oh, wow. Yeah, that she, is amazing. She's a, she's a historian and anthropologist. And so she's looking at um, different things with, within those fields right there. But she's right here from the Inland Empire, from, from San Bernardino. And I want people to always understand those stories because, you know, those are stories that we just don't hear. We just don't know. And mm -hmm. so if kids can see it, then they, they, then they can know that it's possible. And before you sign off today, you know what I just realized, Hardy? Um, I know your sister, Paulette. Yep. <laughs> I know your sister, Paulette, both my husband and I do. And when we first moved out here to Corona, while we've been out here, uh, what, almost 19 years now, um, both um, Paulette and Kirby is her husband, right? Yep. We're, yep. were very, very instrumental in creating relationships with my husband and, wow. and different things like that. Yeah. So very small world and it didn't connect until you said black voice news a couple of times and i'm like wait hold on that's paulette's thing <laughs> you know yes, so that, is, that yeah. is my sister yeah very is, very small world sister. and you have another and, sister too right well i have three sisters i, yeah, I, yeah, okay. I, have, I have three sisters so um, my oldest sister lynn summers uh she just retired from kaiser permanente she does all of our like black farming history stuff so mm. she's into the earth and black farming and things like that and, and and emergency preparedness uh then my little and then paulette and then myself and then and then our youngest sister regina lives in sacramento okay. and she runs the california black media that's our our liaison to the governor's office she used to work up there and uh and she does all of our our, our con connections statewide so okay. we actually have a statewide from from you know from the begin from the top of the state to the bottom of the state that's how you do it <laughs> yep and Kirby's at UCR. Yeah, theater at UCR. or is it film? Theater or film? Yeah, or theater, theater and film. Yeah, yeah, both. yeah, both. And then I'm the HBCU person, so I bring in historically black mm -hmm. colleges. I used to work for United Negro College Fund. I worked for the nation's first historically black college, owned and operated by African Americans. That's Wolf, that's Wilberforce University, which is why you see my studies on Wilberforce because I start mm -hmm. to look at his life and the impact and why would we name a college after him. So I go through and I, I train on those types of things as well. So, yeah. Well, very I'm, nice to meet you. I know. I'm sorry I if I'm supposed to know this already, but um, all, those, all these documents and things that you're showing. So mm -hmm. where, where would a teacher be able to find them to be able to use in their life? Like, are they, can they, can we find them right away and use them? So we're building a Black Voice Archive. We have okay. a partnership with Cal State San Bernardino. We wrote a grant over during the COVID time. And so we're building the archive. But I, I literally, like, they're sitting right here. We have. Well, I know. And I'm like, how does he just have these all in his house? Like, where do you oh, yeah. get these? Oh, I noticed the white glove. Don't think I didn't oh, yeah. notice Oh, that. yeah. But I'm like. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> so we've turned it into a traveling exhibit. I bring it out. So I've brought it out to okay. uh, several schools in Corona where I've spoken several several times. We have things like this. Like this is just sitting here. Yeah. Um, th the reason why you guys would know what this book is, this is the Underground Railroad. This is the book from William Steele. When Harry Tubman ran away and made it to freedom, when she was a freedom seeker, she got there. He interviewed each one of those people. Harry Tubman was one of those, but also Henry Box Brown. When you hear the story of Henry Box yes. Brown, which is told, yeah. Yeah. Henry mailed himself to yeah, this right. guy, William Steele. Oh, this is the original book. This is, this is the first edition copy of the book. Hmm. Yeah. So you come to schools? So that's what you're saying? I know you're right. Yes. Well, well, because I was just thinking too, like um, the reason I think in elementary education, we don't, well, A, we don't get into social studies as much and that's a whole testing issue because it's ELA and math and then it's isolated passages and whatnot. I just think when I saw what you showed, even like, like your primary resource of like the law, um, if teachers could grab those little snippets and just put that up there and have those discussions for that letter you said with like those, you know, two questions. I mean, that could be done at the elementary level. The, the problem I see with elementary, not, not the problem, the challenge is it's got to be packaged, ready to go. Goodness. Yeah. And that's, we don't necessarily have that, you know? And so well, what we do in working with people, especially who've gone on the tour, is we actually make this available for them. I okay. send this out to them, people who go on the tour, they have access to all my information, including you know, me coming. I, I, I come out to the school okay. and I'll bring this and I put the white gloves on the kids. Like I don't put this in plastic and say, you can never touch it. Jerry Gore, who is our historian in Kentucky, who's from an enslaved family, who's Addison White's great, great grandson. And he's, he passed away, never had children. And when he passed away, his family donated all this stuff to us. Wow. So we took the artifacts and then we started going out and trying to find more to tell more of a complete story. And that's when I started saying, oh, okay. So we now own over, I wanna say, I think we have over 5,000 pieces in our collection. Wow. Yeah. And, and I have things that will blow your mind. Like I've held things from Thomas Paine. I've held mm -hmm. things, I've, I've, I've held like original documents that you guys would be like, wait a minute, are you serious? I've stood in the place. I've actually stood on the exact place where Harriet Beecher Stowe saw the slave auction block that inspired her to write wow. the Tom's Cabin. Wow. That's what we that's what we do on a tour. Yeah. I mean, we physically yeah. go there. And then when you take it and you start to understand more to the story. So for example, mm -hmm. they tell the story of Harriet Tubman about having seizures. But the mm -hmm. reason why she had seizures is she was hit in the head by the overseer right. and that caused her to have seizures. But mm -hmm. take a look at this. This is a medical science book. So I teach about scientific racism. I teach about all those different things. This book, let me see if I can blow it up for you guys to see it. This is, uh, let me just do share. How do you do share? Play slideshow. I think it does it, right? We'll see. Yes, there it goes. So this page, so it blows up big on your screen. You guys can look at it. This is a, a medical library, a, a medical book from 1898. The term in this book which stayed for almost 75 years even after slavery is the term is called draptomania. Draptomania is a, meta, it's a mental aberration in which an individual has a desire to run away. This is what they said Frederick Douglass and Harry Tubman had. The person's name is Sam, Dr. Samuel Cartwright. He was a scientific racist who did a lot of work down in Louisiana. And when you look at the work that was happening in, in the South, they were writing pieces mm -hmm. that would go to the political leaders and they would use that to justify the things mm -hmm. that they did. Mm -hmm. And so I think kids can understand that. They can understand those conversations because we talked about what happened with the Holocaust. We talked yeah. to them about I what know. happened with other yeah. people. Yes. And so if they can understand that, they can understand this as well. So in, in one, of my, one of my exhibits, I was showing all this stuff because like, like I said, I have tough stuff to show. Mm -hmm. And I was showing, and this older white gentleman comes up to me, we start having this conversation. He says, you know, I don't know if you should show that. He says, you know, mm -hmm. you're showing some tough stuff. And I said, no, no, here's the reason why. And I explained just like I explained to you guys. And he says to me, he says, okay. And about a month later, I get a letter in the mail. And the letter in the mail says, you know what? I thought about what you said, and you are right. I've been holding on to this in my family. It's my grandfather's, and I feel horrible about it, but I want to make a change. And I want to make a change for our family. So I'm sending you my grandfather's Nazi <gasps> Wow. Crazy. As long as you tell the story about how I was able to make a change. This is, when we talk about impact and the things we're trying to do, 
I'm gonna let other people do necessarily just the, 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 the writing of the pieces. I think what we really need to do is go back to the original of changing our hearts. That's what historical empathy is about. If we understand each other's story, we can look in at the change of the heart. We can understand why these policies were made, how it's impacting us every single day and how we're not gonna fix things until we go back to the heart, until we start going back to these conversations. Um, I purchased all of the stuff from, we own all the original stuff from Carl Brigham, who created the SAT, which is then created the, the AP test and all those different things, mm -hmm. or the SAT test. I own all his original research. Wow. I have, it right, have it right here in my collection. We, we read all the original research. And when you go back and look at that, that's also a part of scientific racism, because in World War I, what he was trying to do was trying to look and study to see if there are different types of soldiers. Can some be the, um, the leaders and can some just be the infantry? Um, and how do you figure out who those people are? And so he started doing tests to figure out who those folks were, um, but they were using scientific racism and, and eugenics to be able to get to that point. And so we own all the collection. We, we own the eugenics paperwork. We own some of the eugenics pieces that went through their, their traveling exhibits that they did, um, all of the, the work. And when you read the writings, that's when you realize we don't get this right we're going to continue this generation after generation after generation hmm. it's, it's not going to go away hardy did you say i'm i'm pretty sure and this is my ignorance for not knowing that you are a member of the rusd school board i am i, I serve on the san Bernardino county board of education okay san yeah. so i I'm, okay. I'm the first Af african-american ever to serve on the san Bernardino county board we represent all 33 school districts, 400,000 students. But then I do a lot of work with Riverside County. So I work with the Riverside County Board over there. And we look at this more as an Inland Empire thing. Um, okay. you know, I have my elected area. I have my elected right. area. But the Inland Empire, I've always had this chip on my shoulder because I grew up out here, that LA County and, and Orange County and San Diego County, everybody looks at us, Riverside and San Bernardino County is like, ah, those people. They do. Right. <laughs> That's just Riverside County. Right. Right. <laughs> but we have so many amazing people. If you go through and look at the history of, of the people that have come through here, the people that have gone into sports, they've gone into creating inventions, the people that have gone into civics, politics, um, leadership, businesses. I mean, McDonald's was founded right around the corner from my office. Mm. The corporation, not Chicago. It was started by two brothers right here. Taco Bell and the Hard Shell Taco right here. Bakers right here. Mm -hmm. Culligan Water, the Culligan people live right, right up the street. You know, when you start to think about that, you start to realize, okay, these people are amazing. So I need their kids to know it, but I also need their teachers, their educators to know it so that they can tell them that you can do it, mm -hmm. that you can do it. If you tell them that they can't and they've never seen anybody do it, then they'll never, they'll never even attempt. But our job as educators is to inspire them, give them example, and then give them the tools so that they can go do it. Have you been able to... Um... I'm not sure how long you've been on the, the, the Board of Education, but have you seen any, I want to say some, some inroads in being able to start changing the culture um, mm -hmm. with all of the information that you have and your experience? Has that been able to, you know, change some hearts and minds maybe at the school board level and within their cabinet? How has that been, especially you being the first African-American and with this yeah. much experience and knowledge? How and, does that and, work? Yeah, and remember, I come off the shoulders of my parents. My mother was elected to yeah. the assembly. Uh, my father is the first African-American to serve two terms as, as president for San Bernardino Unified Board. Uh, he has a school named after him in the, in the city. So we're a family that comes from this standpoint. Uh, and I remember having a conversation with my dad. He just sent me a picture the other day of my grandfather and me with, when I was a little boy. And he says to me, he says, you know, your grandfather had this chair in his house. And even though we were sharecroppers, um, at his funeral, every senator, judge, all kinds of people showed up to his funeral. And I was like, why? He said, because your grandfather led the, the, the NAACP during that time. And when he led the NAACP, they worked together with the community to move the entire community together. They fought racism, they fought discrimination, but they fought together. And so that's where my dad got it. That's where me and my sisters, that's where we now have it. And that's what we're handed off to the next generation. So now that I'm on the board, uh, the first thing we do, by the way, I bring this stuff to my board meetings. We have conversations about this in my board meetings. We have an amazing team. Our, our superintendent here is solid. The superintendent in Riverside County is solid. 
um, and our board members, they're solid, they really care. We have different ways of doing things, but we all have an equal respect because we've had conversations. And I try to try to lead by example in that area um, and in the staff. So one of the things that Dr. Judy White did and Ted Alejandro did with both of our boards and now Dr. Gomez is that they were able to put together equity departments mm -hmm. in the county level that now is inspiring equity departments in all the different districts. Right, right. So think about that. You have 50, 53, 54 school districts in the entire Inland Empire, San Bernardino, Riverside County. Because we're now leading those talks, you're starting to see the talks go into the districts mm -hmm. and not just the bigger districts, the smaller districts. Mm -hmm. I drove out for a board meeting in Needles one day. Wow. Where I had to step in and as a county board member, be a, a, a board member there. And I learned about the Native American tribes there out mm -hmm. on the uh, out on the on the border. And I had no clue that they were there. But in speaking to the folks, I learned their story. Mm -hmm. And we were able to appoint a Native American woman who had graduated from Needle Schools onto their board to be able to make change. Mm -hmm. That's what we're doing. Like we're literally going out there trying to to do this, and we're not fighting. It's it's not a fight. Our board, they they care. Like I said, we might do things differently, but they care about the Inland Empire. They care about our kids. They care about the teachers, and they care about our parents. So we use that to to move them forward. Mm -hmm. Yep. And if our listeners wanted to learn more about you or more about your work or possibly the, the artifacts collection, where would you tell them to go? So we have a website. It is BV Foundation, as in Black Voice, bvfoundation.org. Um, we're part of the Inland Empire um, Black Voice newspaper. They can look that up as well. We do traveling exhibits where we're in multiple school districts where we'll take that information out. And then we're working on our new projects and our new projects include, um, we just were sponsored a national sponsor doing augmented reality. So we're gonna be uh, launching an AR app um, with a company called Imagine AR out wow. of upstate New York. And they're gonna be helping us take this information and imagine you open this John Rankin book and just like Obi-Wan Kenobi, it pops open and he pops out and he's actually explaining different things to you. There are wow. things that we can do. And so we're looking at bringing STEM and technology to these pieces, but we will work with UC Riverside. We'll work with Cal State San Bernardino. We have our archives, we have our website, and then we're local. So we, we go to a lot of these schools and, and I've always tried to figure out, do I branch out and go like statewide, nationwide, or do I just become the person who works directly in our, in our community? And I look back at my parents and my parents have lived in the same community um, as long as I've been alive. And I realized how important it is for us to give back to our community. So yes, I will help other areas, but I'm really passionate about making sure that the Inland Empire voice, San Bernardino, Riverside County, uh, that we come together and, and really push ourselves forward. And there's still work to be done. Mm -hmm. Yes, so much work to be done. So much work to be done, but you guys are doing it. You know, when, when you, you guys are doing it. So let me ask you this. I'm going to turn the tables on you. Why do you do what you do? What is your why? Why are you here like in education, trying to make a change? Like, what is your why? Who wants to dive in first? Okay, I'll go. And then I'll make it fast, I think. No, I'll make it fast. Um, I'm not the one that grew up thinking I was going to be a teacher. That wasn't like my thing. So when I graduated from college, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I, I've always been into community service, volunteering things. So I did AmeriCorps, the national program. And so they station you, I was on the East Coast, and they put you in different projects, young people in different projects, healthcare, education, um, so that you could see, like ignite a spark, right? And so what might you be interested in? And so from there, there were so many different things that I was seeing within our own country, you know, that I never knew to the extent, I guess maybe that some existed. And so for me, edu public education specifically is where we will make the most change for people is what my belief is. So I, I use like public education more as a means for change, you know, for the better change systems, change things for people. So that's where why I'm here. I love that. Thank you. For me, it, it started, um, it's deeply rooted in a, a faith-based calling. 
And again, teaching was not something that I definitely planned on doing. I was trying to go into cosmetology and my father was like, hell no, you won't. <laughs> you know? So I, he said, you go to college and um, after you graduate, you know, then you can do whatever you want to do. And um, I got married right after college. So I was cut off financially from parents. So I needed to pay for cosmetology school. So I, caught, I started teaching. But I did not know that that was um, where the Lord put me for a reason. And it's been well over, it's been 20 something years now. And um, through that, and just through listening and, and following and allowing myself to be led, um, it, I was able to reflect on just my life and, and really of service. So for me, it is, uh, again, very personal. How can others see the Lord through me? And how can I serve in many different capacities? So every role that I've been in, um, I see it as a service role about honestly changing lives. For me, it's about changing lives and, and, and souls because we deal in souls. We don't deal with widgets. We deal in souls. And, um, and I don't think that we always realize how sometimes uh, it's not always about being doing the work and being in the forefront, but sometimes being still and being the cog in the wheel is what's needed. And so the older that I've gotten and you allow yourself to be used um, and you listen and you follow and you learn more and you grow more. Um, I've seen over time and time again, that sometimes it's about being in the space, but you've got to be prepared as well because you don't know what you're going to encounter. So it's been a balance of those pieces. And I'd say the last five years, um, especially after working with these lo lovely ladies and getting my doctorate, my passion is really in educating educators. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I do what I do from the realm of UCR all the way um, across the range from K-12 school districts. Perfect. Did I tell you guys about our empathy certificate? I don't know if I told you guys about that. No. Okay, so I'll tell you this real quick and then, and then we'll move since you guys keep talking. But uh, about four years ago, I had a vision and the vision was, I think that we could take this information that we're doing and we could actually do um, a certificate in empathy in underground railroad studies. So we started shopping the idea around to different universities. Um, some people were looking at me like, party, you're crazy. This is before everybody started talking empathy and equity, right? This is before that. Uh, and, and I kept digging away at it. And, and I don't have an educator's background from K through 12 outside of being on the school board. Um, I, like I said, I worked at a university, I work with corporations. So I understood what we were looking for. And so I didn't know how to build the curriculum. So we ended up partnering with Cambridge College out of Massachusetts. They work with us and we work with their dean here locally uh, in, in Ratchet Cucamonga. They have a satellite campus, but their main campus is in Boston. And we started working with them. We went through all of the different things that we need to do. We just got approved late last year. You guys can see it on my website, a fully accredited 16 graduate credits in empathy and wow. underground railroad studies. We wrote the curriculum. We put everything together. It is actually approved. And we're looking for even new partners locally. We would love to be able to do something like that. Our tour was approved for four credit uh, graduate credits. And this is master's level, like master's level stuff. So our goal was to be able to send it to school districts so that educators who go on the tour then can come back, take four classes, get 16 graduate credits, and then move up on the pay scale. Nice. That was, that was our goal. So literally we wrote that. I spent, I want to say three years shopping it, a year writing it, and then we, we launched it last year. And now we're trying to um, pick up professors and we're trying to pick up uh, students who will want to come to the program. But we'd love to work with UC Northside too. <laughs> I would, I would, I would love to work with you guys and bring some of the work we do. You know, I'll pass it on. I'll pass it on yeah. because we just opened up a, um, a ethnic studies pathway, and that mm -hmm. just opened up this year through our teacher yeah. education program. So yeah, yeah, we're we're working with Cal State San Bernardino through their archives with the president. Um, they're looking at taking. You know how they have that Cal State, uh, I think it's, what is it, CSU um, ethnic studies program that they have to now approve that they have to do. Um, so they can actually take, I'll go on our tour and we're working with the president of Cal State San Bernardino to make nice. our tour that ethnic studies course. Nice. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, we've, we've been working. We've, we've been working. So everybody else, what's your why? I think Kim and Kate. 
Um, I think I was like Anne Marie and, and Ivy. I said in high school, I will never be a teacher. They were so unappreciated. Um, I'll never. And then I went into film school and the only jobs that I could get were like minimum wage commuting far out into Los Angeles. So I said, I'll start substitute teaching to make some money. And day one, I knew right away. It just to see the kids were actually engaged and it was my first day and it looked fun. And um, so I've been asked that question a lot, like, why are you a teacher? Why are you a teacher? And I couldn't quite articulate it because it's many things, but when I watched, um, I think it was Michelle Obama's Becoming on Netflix, mm -hmm. she just talked about just loving and being rejuvenated off of working with young people. And I like to envision all that they will become. And of course, all that they, you know, they can do that we're, um, I guess, putting on their generation with their young enthusiasm to, I guess, make change. That's powerful. Thank you. That's great. I guess my story is different. I knew I was going to be a teacher in the fourth grade um, and I never wavered. <laughs> my mom is a teacher <laughs> and I spent many uh, August putting up bulletin boards my whole life um, and getting grading papers. I remember grading, she was an English teacher. I was grading papers from very early age and I just knew that that's what I was destined to do. I also witnessed her like we brought in she brought in a lot of students that needed help and um and I too am inspired by young people I just think they have so much potential that they don't yet realize they have and they're at you know this beautiful stage of life where they have the whole world in front of them where they can you know become these amazing humans and I knew I was going to be an English teacher because I love a story um, and I majored in British literature, which I you know seems silly, but I really thought I was going to like teach Pride and Prejudice and, and Shakespeare, and then everyone was just going to fall in love with it like I did. Um, and then little did I know that I, I read a lot of stories about people who looked like me and my teachers looked a lot like me. So that's probably why I connected to those stories so much. So now I just love finding, you know, stories that kids can connect with. Um, and yeah, I, I always think like, even my husband's like, gosh, don't you wish you did something else? And no, I've never wished a different profession ever. I've, I knew in the fourth grade, I just, <laughs> I just knew what I was going to do and I've never wavered. So British literature, what's, what are the dates in British literature that you studied? What's, what's your, what's your time period? So I studied 1800 and so up until 1800 old. Okay, so up until 1800. Yeah. So in my collection, it's not literature, it's not considered literature, but I have an original copy of William Wilberforce's book from 1799. Um, when he was in the House of Commons, one of the things that he did is he is, he's basically Abraham Lincoln, but from Great Britain. And so for the last year, I've actually done this huge study on Thomas Clarkson, on um, Oladai Equiano, on um, William Wilberforce, on um, Granville Sharp. And I'm looking at all these different people from, from Great Britain and how just a small group of people made change of the world. And I'm using those stories to say, listen, this is, this is not like you know, this major group of, of leaders. This was a group of people who just believed in something and they kept fighting until people would listen. And it took them years, like literally 20 years for people to say, from where, when we're gonna start to where we're gonna get with people to vote to end the transatlantic slave trade, it took all those people working together. And so I love reading those stories. Um, I just finished, there's a, there's a documentary, you guys asked me a question earlier about, about what I'm watching. I just finished this whole series on, it's called The Last Castle, and it's on Netflix. And it blew my mind because what it was talking about were the, the Danes and the Saxons fighting it out as the, as the uh, what was it, the Vikings and all the different stuff to create the Eng one England. And I had knew, no clue of the story. But when I started to watch the story, I started to reach out to my world history teachers. And I was like, is this stuff real? Did this really happen? And they were like, uh, yeah. And once they explained it to me, now I'm starting to look back at that because it helps me to understand the attitudes that's happening to us today. When you, st when you start to look at the Danes and the Saxons and what went during, down during that time, and then you start to, I've read a lot of African, um, a lot of African researchers, so Diop and people like that who've done research from Africa, 
I can now see where our world conversation came together to get us where we are today. And I think that people don't realize that they need to look at it probably from a war world perspective than just US, you know, 1820 to 1860. There are things that we have blackouts in our news. Like we had a blackout. This is a thing called the Tacky, it's the Tacky War and then the Haitian Revolution. The Tacky War happened in, in Jamaica and the Haitian Revolution is what ended up basically getting Britain out of Haiti and then also getting Napoleon out of Haiti. Those two wars, when you look at the newspapers from the 1800s in the United States, especially in the South, blackouts. Like literally blackouts. You, you, it's hard to even find a story. And I realized the reason why they didn't want anybody to know is because that's the first time that enslaved Africans figured out a way to war against the, their, their oppressors and they beat them. And not only did they beat them once, but they beat them twice, which is what inspired Napoleon to sell the Louisiana Purchase. Because he was like, dude, I'm done, I'm out. And so you start to look at all these stories and you're like, what? The places that we go, you know, I was in, I was in Washington Courthouse where Harry Beecher Stowe did her piece. That same place, Daniel Boone lived there. I had no clue. I had no clue. When I look at what happened with um, in, in Texas, what is it called in Texas when the Mexican army and the United States, when they, when they fought, what was that called? The Alamo. The Alamo. The Alamo. So when that happened, that was a lot about Mexico abolishing slavery and taunting the United States. If you, don't, if you only look at it from a, war, from a United States perspective, you, will, you, you miss the bigger picture that all of us are connected and all these different things are happening. Um, people like, um, what was his name, Thomas Clarkson, those kind of people met Frederick Douglass. They met Ben Franklin, um, Payne, uh, Thomas Payne. They were inspired when they started seeing Thomas Clarkson's, Clarkson's writings. And that's what caused them to start coming back here to the United States and having those, those, those conversations. So I think that it's important for us to look at it from a worldwide perspective. So I love the fact that you did British history and you did it from, you know, pre-1800, I totally get it now. Uh, I spent the last year kind of studying it and I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by that, that particular topic in that area. Gosh. Yes, until I can totally nerd out and do stuff. Oh, wow. Now. And I was going to say, and I'm just watching WandaVision. So. <laughs> I've, I've watched that too. I've, my daughter, she had me. Don't watch, tell me. I'm on episode five. Okay. I've watched all the Marvel in line, in order. Yes. Me too. Yes. I did it during COVID. Yes. During COVID, I'm like, what will we do with ourselves? Marvel in complete chronological, the way it's supposed to be watched order. And I never watched all of the Star Wars, only original. We watched all the Star Wars. I haven't, in I haven't COVID. done that yet. Yeah. yeah just well, finished, good luck. Just takes a while. Ant-Man. Was it Ant-Man, Ant-Man, and Wasp? I just Wasp. finished that just the other day. And so I was like, okay, this is really cool. I'm not a big Sweet. fan of Thor. The Thor series is weird. See, Stop those ones out. are my favorite. The first one. Really? The first one. Especially Ragnarok. That is like. That's a good one. one. I agree. They're not all good. Yeah. They're not, I'm going to have they're, to go back. Yeah. I'm going to try to watch that then. I'm going to have to try The to first one I thought that was. Wait, one is that, good. The first maybe one I had I really low expectations, good. though. When I went to see Thor, I'm like, this ain't going to be good. And then I'm like, oh. No, it's not. The first one's just not good with Natalie Portman. It's just not. Oh, um, well. And then you do realize that that's her. That's the person who's in WandaVision, the person who was working with her, right? No, huh? no clue. Okay, oh, so no you know clue. the person who is working that they called, she's now a doctor. She was an assistant in Thor number one. Oh, yes. she did you recognize her. Yes. Okay, yeah, I like her. Okay, I'm a check We're a big Marvel house. So we've seen all okay. of them multiple the time. Yes, we even well, go on YouTube that. and watch all the analysis and all that stuff. <laughs> That's my kid. Uh, yeah, my, my, my daughter, she'll be like, oh, what? Look what they said on, on YouTube. They said, yeah, this. yeah. <laughs> yeah, so so we still do the, we, I'm not 100% history all the time. I, I do some fun stuff. Oh, well. no, I like it. See, this is the thing. If we could all be teachers and really know it like you do, everyone, all the students would be like, oh, amazing, you know? And imagine so, if you guys at your teacher training programs mm -hmm. could instill this type of passion. I know into your teachers so they can instill it into, into. Well, you already you know. made me think all these primary like sources and these documents are artifacts, not that we could get any sort of original copy, but that's what should be loaded up in some of the, our elementary schools. 
like student work, but then like, boom, these amazing pieces. Then you could walk through your own school and have these little tours and get them kind of, what is this? They could lead their parents through just super cool stuff like that. Yeah. And that's what we're going to do with our, our augmented reality. But, okay. I, no, but, I, but I wanted to say really quick, in thinking of both our pre-service and our in-service teachers, it's kind of what we say also, though, about the, the journey of, you know, truly embracing access and equity that there's so much of this that our teachers don't know, both pre-service and in-service. So there also has to be not front-loading because that's just downloading the information. It's what you're talking about, like changing the heart. Like some of that work has to be done as well, you know, mm -hmm. because what I imagine is even worse, this information being presented um, inaccurately or inadequately or, you know, mm -hmm. and effectively. So it's about wrapping our heads around how can we do both of those pieces or just have some truly well-built programs mm -hmm. that honestly start with our pre-service teachers, because that's where it's at. That's when we're getting all of the pedagogy, mm -hmm. you know, once they get here, it's really the practicum, you know, over and over and over and then the support and continuing that learning. But the, those heavy duty, that heavy duty work, it has to start like before they step foot in the classroom, again, my opinion, yeah. and, and from the research I've done, and then provide the appropriate support to continue the learning and enhance it and those, those resources that you're talking about, Emory. So all the tenets of adult learning, the information is there on how we need to provide education for teachers, but we're not considering that. And that's not just at the school site, that's all the way on up. We're not considering mm -hmm. how do adults learn and a humongous variable in that is relevance. Yeah, mm -hmm. it just is. That's powerful. Okay. Now on the tour, these are the talks that we have. Mm -hmm. It's not just history all day. We literally have these conversations and we bring multiple districts together so that you can hear the different things. And they'll say, yeah. oh my God, I didn't know that was happening in your district. This is what's happening in my district. Oh, what? And you start to build that collaboration and, and, and that's what happens. So yeah, we, we, we have to do better. We have to do better. And, and you know, that's that's our job. On our level at the county board, we've done that. We've, we've actually opened up, have some amazing training, training both mm -hmm. in Riverside and San Mateo County. I know uh, that Dr. Charles Brown and uh, Dr. Talisa Sullivan and Dr. Um, Dr. Kaisha Holmes, they're working in leadership over in Riverside County. And then we've got Dr. Sharina Betters, who we stole from uh, San Jacinto, who's now our chief equity officer in San Bernardino County. And they're mm -hmm. doing trainings. We're working with districts. We're trying to train them and develop them. But, we're, but we have those conversations. How do we make it relevant? How do we make mm -hmm. it worth somebody's time? So when they walk away, they're just not like, another training. <laughs> it's true. Yep. And nobody wants to talk about it because it's too political. Mm. If we want to move things together for our kids, that's what we do. Right. We, 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 it's for our kids. Yep. That's all well, th talks. Thank you, Hardy. I think we lost Ivy. So yes. maybe it is time to say goodbye. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, Hardy. It was so nice Hardy to meet time. you. Pleasure meeting you all. Anytime, let me know if you guys need me to come back or even bring the stuff out because you guys saw what? Five pieces, six pieces? I have 5,000. I have pieces oh that would blow God. your mind. I may be contact you pieces. to arrange that. I know. Seriously, yeah. I got to talk to my principal. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Cool. Thank Bye, you. everybody. Thank you for your Bye. time. Bye. Bye-bye.